When you set out to do good and help someone or a group of people, how do you describe them? I'm a master's student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and today I want to talk about the language we use to characterize the people we want to support and uplift. Let's examine the framing of this hypothetical mission statement. We are a food aid organization designed to support at-risk families, or we're a culinary program aimed at underperforming youth. These are likely well-intentioned, but they use a deficit-based lens where we define people by their problems, instead of recognizing the obstacles they're facing as systemic exclusion and discrimination that is external to the individual. This is so common in our society and media, we learn to label people by their problems, which culturally then grooms us to combine these two ideas together. Compare this to asset-based framing, which describes people based on their desires and contributions in face of challenges and sees them as valuable even before they receive help. So to rephrase, we could try something like we're a food aid organization on a mission to disrupt food apartheid by distributing fresh groceries to working class BIPOC families. Now it's clear the fault is in the system, not the people. You may be thinking, what's the big deal? These are just words. But the thing is, deficit-based framing also affects the way we go about trying to create change. You may have heard the term poverty porn, where media will go document in great detail the conditions of those who are suffering in order to elicit support for a certain cause. Damage-centered research follows in a similar pattern where researchers go out to document the pain and brokenness of certain groups of people as to hold those in power accountable. These approaches end up perpetuating the idea that those being helped are one-dimensional, broken, and hopeless. It assumes that these people are not doing anything to improve their own situation and implicitly calls upon a theory of change that is predicated on the proof of harm. In her open letter, Suspending Damage, Professor Eve Tuck asked researchers to consider the long-term consequences of, quote, thinking of ourselves as damaged. She then offers a new approach, which she calls a desire-based framework. That means understanding the complexity, contradiction, and self-determination of the groups that have experienced harm, but are so much more than just that. This means creating research trajectories that are critical of past realities, but are more centered on future aspirations. I'll let you go ahead and think about how this applies to your own work and make sure to come back next week for more learnings.